Hello, mental workers, and welcome back to the podcast. I know I say it every time, but I'm really excited about this episode. It's just a really good one. And it was really prompted by my observations that it's bloody hard to find placements in psychology, not just for me, but for everyone. It just seems ridiculously difficult. And so I wanted to know what is happening here. I just feel like there is something I am missing and what better person to take us through it than return guest Avril. Hi, Avril. Hi, Bronwyn. Thanks so much for having me back. My pleasure. And so Avril, please remind the listeners who you are and what you do. So I am a clinical psychologist by training and I'm currently the director of Bodhi and Psychology and we do clinical practice there, training, supervision um, and workshops. Excellent. Thank you, Avril. So listeners, today we're going to cover like, why does it seem so hard to find placements? Why is it hard for universities to find placements for students? Why is it hard for organizations to offer placements? What can be done to improve the situation and what is currently being done? And how can provisional psychs, registrars, five plus oneers find suitable placements? And we're going to get into a bit of like the politics of it as well and see how we go. Sound good, Avril? Sounds great. Sounds great, Bron. (laughs) Okay. So I'll start with the personal observation, which is that I have gone through the five plus one program and it was really hard to find a placement for my plus one year. I think Mm. I sent out a billion emails, contacted, cold called people, and now I'm doing it all over again for my post bridging course. And it is still bloody hard, even as a registered psychologist. So I guess just take us through maybe your experiences being the placement coordinator previously. What was it like for you to find placements for your students? Yeah, well, I I realised I didn't actually introduce this aspect of why I'm here, (laughs) which is (laughs) might be helpful for the listeners. Yeah, helpful. (laughs) Yeah, I once upon a time I was a placement coordinator at um, at a university, higher education university. Um, so I'm well acquainted with the challenges you're experiencing from when, even as someone who was at the time also very well connected with, with people who provide placements, I've also myself provided, uh, supervision placements in a number of different settings. Um, and I provide supervisor training, um, for people who, who have wanted to become a supervisor or need to do update that and become, a, um, maintain their, their status and have a masterclass. Um, so that's sort of the perspectives I come from when talking about this topic. That's really helpful to know. And what's your experiences been like in your previous role as a placement coordinator? Yes. Well, I encountered very similar problems to you, Rowan. It is such a challenging role because placements are universally very difficult to, to, to get. Um, even for large organizations, for universities that have longstanding relationships and histories with um, supervisors. So it is definitely not just your experience. It is a collective experience. It is something that all of the universities have identified as a real problem. And um, there is you know, a meeting of all of those placement coordinators annually where <laughs> this is the prime topic of discussion. So you're not alone. <laughs> I mean, if it's the prime topic of conversation, it's probably been going on for a few years, hey? Absolutely. It's been yeah. going on for a long time. It's been one of the probably the rate limiting factor in us providing um, new graduates to the profession. Um, It's a real bottleneck. Yeah, because I mean, that's another aspect of it, which is like, we all want more placements so that we can have more psychologists because it's recognized that we have a workforce shortage. And so are you saying that really, this is, this is the factor, like not being able to find placements? It is one of the biggest factors. Absolutely. So when universities are providing uh, positions, they have to consider whether or not they can actually graduate their students. They become a financial and a practical liability if we can't graduate students. And then you get a bottleneck in your in your in your training programs where you suddenly have a maybe a cohort of 20 that you need to get placements for. If they can't get it one year, then you've got a cohort of 25 or 30. And then that keeps going on. So it is something that causes programs to limit the number of placements that they offer, uh, sorry, the number of positions they offer in their programs. Um, there, but there are a whole host of other factors that influence this as well. Okay. So can we go to why is it so hard for places to offer placements? Like why isn't it that I can just approach a place and they're like, oh, Brandon, we were waiting for you to contact us. We're so delighted. <laughs> We've got this space just here for you. Here's a new beauty desk. We can't wait for you to come on board. Thanks. <laughs> well, I'm sure they would if they knew you, Bronwyn. <laughs> 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 well, 
<laughs> Look, there are so many background factors to this. One of the biggest, like um, if I start at the base of the pyramid, so to speak, is because we are so under-resourced in this sector. Ah, okay. So we have, I mean, traditionally a lot of the placements and a lot of good quality placements were in um, health, so in government-run, funded, large organisations with the infrastructure available. We have had that systematically um, defunded for, you know, maybe for very good reasons and it's gone into community sector, it's gone into NGO sector, but the infrastructure that came with health hasn't really followed into the into the PHN and into the community health networks. So we have um, a lot of flow of the profession into private practice as well. And private practice is also not structured in a way that can easily host a student. So we have dwindling numbers in the places that could provide it. And then for people in health, they're so overworked, they're so overstretched that to add add a student into the mix is often something that is just too much. It's going to tip. It's going to tip the team over into into something that is unmanageable. So it's one of the big issues as to why individuals but teams also decide not to take on students. A lot of the feedback that I heard from placement providers and my my connections um, of people who are eligible to provide supervision is that they would love to but they simply cannot. It is such a huge responsibility and there isn't the resources that's provided to them to be able to do justice to the student. So a lot of the time, the the placement provider, the individual is saying, I would love to, but I can't look after the student appropriately. I can't teach them appropriately. This place is chaos. Mm, So is it a matter of time then? Like they don't have the capacity to say, spend an hour with the student a day or a week? Yeah, it's it's a number of things. It's like if you've got a, a clinical team that is hugely overstretched, you don't they don't have the time to be sitting down providing supervision. They also don't necessarily have the time to be sitting in with a supervisee thinking about their learning needs. The other thing is in a lot of health sectors, um, the workload of a student is not accounted for. So it's almost like additional work that they're not acknowledged for or credited for. So it really like when, when an individual is weighing up whether or not they can manage this, it often tips them over to have a student. I think a lot of psychologists take their responsibilities very seriously and they want to be able to provide a supportive, good experience. And I think the other factor is that in the health sector, there is a lot of complexity where you do really need to be alongside your student. You need to be teaching them, you need to be guiding them and you need to, you need to do that to keep them safe and the client safe. And so when you can't feel that you can do that justice, you just decide, I can't actually offer a placement. Yeah. When you give us that perspective, it really makes sense. Like I can really empathize with them and it's like, I want to do a good job. I want to assist this student, but I just simply don't have the resources to do that. Yes, that's right. Mm. And I think the system as a whole, unfortunately, you know, if we think about the medical system, it's structured entirely differently. And I think this is part of the issue is that it's almost seen as like a an add-on, something that the psychologists individually provide back to the profession. But it's not actually structured. Our profession is not structured in a way that accounts for that or supports that. Say, for example, you've got doctors doing their training. There are allocated jobs in each hospital and every it is part of the workforce and it is part of senior people in leadership to provide that supervision. They are an integral part of the team. They get paid, they get a salary, they have a job. Now, that is not the case with psychology. It's almost seen as a volunteer kind of opt-in process. Like you might want to do it, Bronwyn, if you want to put something on your CV, you might want to do it if you want to give back to the profession, but there's no role for a junior psychologist on the team. They don't have a particular job. They don't get paid. There isn't a desk. There's no sense of them in the entire (laughs) system, right? (laughs) Oh my gosh. I'm feeling the anger rise in me again because I'm just like, oh, I I find labor. Great. So you just do that if you want to, and you can get recognized. So we're not going to provide a role for you or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. And and what that does mean as well is that I think, you know, a lot of health is flying by the seat of their pants because everything is very underfunded, but there has been an oversight into the workforce shortage is going to come as a result of not being able to provide placements and not being able to provide good training opportunities. And that's certainly what the supervisors and um, people hiring are saying to me is that, you know, maybe in these complex settings, there's a lot of graduates coming out without good experience. They're coming out without that ability to work with multidisciplinary team members or without hospital experience or without working with that complexity because they haven't had the opportunity to get a placement in those settings where they would learn that. 
Wow, it really sounds like we're stuck, like there's multiple things that needs to change for it to happen that we can be offering students placements. Is that it? Yes, yes, yes. And I haven't even covered all of them. That's just probably one part oh, of it with, with health. Okay. So let's talk about, okay, so that's with the, I uh, know, that's with the public health se- sector. Public health sector. Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah. Can we talk about um, private practices yes. and what makes it difficult for them to offer placements or is it a little bit easier or are there different factors? Look, it's it, it really depends on the organisation and I'd say <clears throat> by and large, most of the private practices that that operate are small. They might be sole traders. There's just one person in a room and people do provide that, but it's usually, again, something that's done because they want to give back to the profession. It doesn't provide, there is, there is sort of financial loss that comes with it. There is no financial incentive for doing it. And it might be something that they want to do to give back to the professional for their own learning and interest and, and desire to support. So again, you've got all the factors working against you. So if you're working in private practice in the Medicare system, um, no provisional psychologist can charge for their their time under Medicare. So how is it that you're providing a service to clients, but you can't get money for that time? And in a business model, that's not sustainable. Mm. So when it is provided, it, it tends to be because there's interest and um, or there is infrastructure, and that often only comes with larger private practice organisations where there is, say, for example, a number of people that have supervisor training or a number of clinicians or a, a business structure that can fund a salary for someone to take time out of their paid client hours to sit with an unpaid supervision setting or sit with a student who has an unpaid client in their, in their caseload. Mm, yeah, it okay, so it sounds difficult for private practices as well. I have yeah. seen a trend in private practices where I think this addresses the financial difficulties, but they've got the provisional psychologist seeing a lot of NDIS clients under behavior support. But then yes. I've seen other concerns about that because it's like if you get all your experience with NDIS clients, that's mainly capacity building. That's the service that we provide with NDIS yeah. clients, and it's not actually direct psychological interventions. Um, I just wondered yes. what your perspective was on that. Yeah, I think that's been a really clever workaround, but again, it, it does create a whole new problem, doesn't it? So yeah. NDIS has been one of those, you know, beautiful spaces that has actually acknowledged the work of provisionals yeah. and provisional psychologists in providing value to, in what they and what they offer and paying for it. So that has been a way to make it actually at least sustainable. At least you break maybe break even um, in providing a placement or get close to breaking even. Very few times is there any kind of profit to be made from from supporting placements. But you're right. It then means that the experience that students are obtaining are in a very specific setting and they often have very clear parameters around what that looks like. So whilst that is an important skill amongst a plethora of skills, it cannot be the only um, experience that you have because you're limiting your ther- long-term therapeutic um, experience, maybe different types of psychological work that you don't get exposed to. Okay. So, I mean, just to summarize so far, it seems that public health is restricted because they lack the resources to provide placements and that's a time-based thing and there's no formal roles for the person to provide a placement. And then private practices, they are usually smaller businesses and they need to be sustainable and they actually lose money most of the time when they take on a student. Are there any other barriers for places providing placements? Absolutely. I mean, the other aspect with health is that they have been systematically um, defunded. So we don't actually have as many psych um, jobs. So there aren't as many people in the health sector who are there to provide placements. So there are fewer and fewer of those roles because those teams haven't been funded. The other aspect is PHNs are very, so um, those networks may be a little bit different depending on which state you're in, but community-based mental health um, they might be public health, but they can also be what is known in New South Wales anyway as PHN. They have more of an NGO type structure and there isn't that history or, or that tradition necessarily of understanding how um, the profession might need to be guided and supported. So we do have psychs in the field, but they're not necessarily as many in number. There isn't the infrastructure there to encourage placements and learning and growth. 
Yeah. So I'm actually thinking of doing a placement with an NGO and I don't know much about NGOs, but here's the limited stuff that I've learned is that they come from a variety of professional backgrounds. And so one of the requirements for placements is that usually you have a psychologist on site, or if you're doing, for example, an endorsement area, you need to have a clinical psychologist supervisor if you're doing the clinical psychology. And you usually need somebody who you can debrief with during the day and have that on-site support. And so an NGO might not necessarily have these sorts of people in place to support you. Correct. And and if there is a psychologist who is a supervisor, they are by and large in that structure in senior senior leadership roles. So when they're doing that, they might be managing whole districts or they might be managing a whole region. And they're the ones, the only ones that can provide one-to-one supervision and guidance. So they're already incredibly overstretched and we don't have those supervisors that may be sort of closer on the ground to be guiding and supporting students. And so it makes it difficult and a lot of pe- lot of psychs in, in um, the NGO sector want to do this, again, to give back because it's of interest to them and their growth, but it's, it's a juggling act. You know what, Avril, I'm beginning to think that having a placement coordinator job really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it, just, was, it seems really hard. Like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was well known in my um, department for having this large whiteboard, like as large as my wall, with all my students' names and almost a little bit like, you know, those crime scenes, like yeah. you can spring from this to that and then they get re Oh, it was... <laughs> yeah, it sounds hectic. It was complex. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And like the celebration you would have if you got a placement, I imagine that's just like a silent fist pump with you and it's like, yes, I five me. Like, I did great. Woo! Yeah. And I will say as a placement um, like coordinator, a lot of those placements hinged on my personal relationships wow. and people giving me favours. Like, yes, we know you, Avril. We'll do it for you, Avril, right? So you're Bronwyn. They're like, we don't know who Bronwyn is. We don't yeah. know. What, what kind of person is she? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So a placement coordinator has a little more buy-in with some of these people who are stretched, don't know you, think, I don't, wanna, I don't want a student that's going to take more time from me. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging right? So mm. it's, it's, it's that other level of relationship that is often required to convince already pressured people that they will take on the placement. Wow. So is it kind of like you would vouch for the students as well? Like, yes. you know, I've got a good student for you. Yes. Well packaged, yes. nice, yes. polite. Yes. 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 Or, or your ability as a placement coordinator to help support a particular student um, with, with the placement. Ah. So having that, having that placement coordinator is actually very valuable if you, you know, you have a challenging placement or you have a challenging dynamic or someone's going through health problems, having that person almost like a case manager to that placement becomes very valuable and becomes necessary to support both student and placement provider. Whereas if you don't have that, you're on your own. Well, you're not completely on your own, but you are more or less on your own unless you have a major problem that you can complain to a university with. So why is there this trend? I've noticed a trend that universities are asking students to source their own placements. If it's the case that placement coordinators can perhaps have a bit more buy-in through their relationship and through other people knowing them, like surely if students are finding their own placements, they're going to have less chances, right? Absolutely. Look, the reason the reason I would say that happens is it's a funding issue. It's one less position that they have to fund. And it usually has to be quite a senior position because people need relationships, experience. Um, they, they need to have a massive skill set. It's difficult for uh, unis to find placements. So what better way to, <laughs> to not have that problem but to say it's not our responsibility, it's your responsibility. That's yeah. a huge problem off their plate. <laughs> it is. Like, okay, great. I can see that from their perspective. And then uh, I think I'm noticing a simmering of resentment amongst the cohort because it's like we're putting in so much labor to find these placements. And then we're still paying the university a few thousand dollars for the privilege of doing the placement. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. It's a bit of a raw deal. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. Just, yeah. just wanted well, to confirm it, that. Okay. Cool. Uh, moving along. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, Avril, are there any other barriers for, say, public health, private uh, NGOs in providing placements to mm. students? Yes, yeah. So, I think the other aspect we haven't yet talked about is like support of supervisors. So, there are, I think, statistic, looking at the statistics, there are enough supervisors registered to provide the number of placements that are needed. However, not all of those supervisors are offering placements, but possibly for the reasons we've discussed. 
And there is a whole new generation of, of practitioners that would like to be supervisors, but the cost of doing the training, the time taken out, the lack of support in the workplace has been something that's made it a little bit too hard to cross. So, I mean, coming to solutions, that has been a solution that has been identified in the sector, which is, okay, we need to actually just train up a whole bunch of supervisors. And that, that was something that I was involved with, which was a collaboration with HETI, which is um, the education organization in New South Wales Health, in that we were contracted to provide mass training for their psychs who wanted to be supervisors. And that was a really great collaboration where both parties identified the need for that. So that's one thing is um, actually making it accessible for supervisors and possible for them to do it. Yep. I would say having been on the side of supervising supervisors and providing training to them, that there is a massive market missing in supporting those supervisors to be supervisors. So a lot of the time they're there on their own. They might have no other psychs around them in, in their team or they might have limited access to the number of um, psychs there and they're providing a placement and it's challenging, just like working with clients. It's a brand new skill. It is a, it is very clinically heavy, but it's unlike anything we've maybe ever done before yeah. if you're not an experienced supervisor. And so I think that can also provide a lot of anxiety for new supervisors who want to get it right, who want to do a good job, who want to do it safely. I, I for a while, there ran a group supervision for supervisors. And there was a lot of, um, I think that met a need around a lot of people feeling anxious um, that they weren't being held by any kind of structure and to have others to talk with and to have others to learn from and have an experienced supervisor to guide them, I think was very, was very valuable. So I think that's another aspect to it as well as just having infrastructure that supports the supervisor to provide supervision. Mm, so if you noticed like through your interactions with supervisors that they're kind of saying, like, I would love to supervise, but I've just felt it's too stressful. Like, I just can't do this on my own. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, we, we know the tendency of psychologists is that we want to do a good job. Yeah. We want to do it right. And if there is risk and we feel we can't manage that risk, we're likely to kind of just go, no, we won't kind of put ourselves in that position. And so I think that is, as a profession, how we approach this issue. Then people would much rather be like, can't do it safely, can't do it really, really well, so I just won't do it. Yeah, that that sounds like us. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <it> does, doesn't <laughs> it? <laughs> yeah. Nope, and nope. Um, okay, so look, there are a lot of difficulties on a lot of levels with providing placements. It's becoming more clear to me why it's so difficult, and then why I've had so much difficulty. You know, cold calling 20, 30 places, and none of them have been able to take me on as a placement student. There's systemic issues. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so what's being done about it? Ah, okay. So we have, we have a few really great things that are happening. I was part of a, a group, um, a group that kind of formed very solidly, had been present for a long time, but was placement coordinators coming together from across um, Australia. And there was always these issues that were being raised and solutions being sought and, and lessons being learned from different states. And they meet, they meet um, usually annually um, across, you know, a particular location in Australia every year. Um, in New South Wales, though, um, we didn't have a collaboration of Super, supervisors and placement coordinators coming together from universities to discuss and address these issues. So in some other states, they had um, placement consortiums and they were able to be very effective in negotiating with larger organizations as a collective. Um, <clears throat> by and large, this did arise within the context of requiring payment for placement, which is something we haven't even discussed yes, yet. Yeah. That is a big thing and it has happened in some other states, which is really concerning where um, places like health or, you know, large, large private hospitals or large NGOs would require universities to pay them for providing the placement. And that has gone ahead. New South Wales, then um, I was part of the team that, that um, developed the New South Wales Consortium where we really strongly pushed back against that. So a number of us had experienced large organisations insisting on payment for placement and we were able to successfully tackle that and push back on that. Can I ask about that? Like yes. just um, yeah. because I've seen that as well and I'm just wondering because you said the barriers of public health were mainly like a resourcing issue. Like mm -hmm. where would that funds go if you if the university did pay them? Like what are they trying to cover? Yes, look, I 
in New South Wales, unless across it in other states, in New South Wales, <clears throat> it had been kind of vaguely mentioned in health, but it was largely coming from the private hospital sector. And because other other areas like nursing um, in other states have that's been a model for a long time, there was the natural extension to okay, oh, psychology. Oh, okay, yes. sure. Yes. Yeah. Now, I mean, the argument that we had is that a nursing grad is very, very different from a endorsement level grad or a fifth year in their plus one process. So you've had X number of years of training already. You've gone through a number of internal placements. It's We're not a first year undergraduate program. Yeah. So th- those sorts of discussions were the discussions being had and pushed back against mm. unsuccessful in other states, unfortunately, and other states have to pay for placements. Yeah, because one of the things that mm. I'm pushing for is like I want all placements to be pl- paid. Um, yeah, I'm just going to say yeah. that again. Like one of the things that I'm pushing for is I want all placements to be paid um, yes. because we know that a significant barrier to diversity in our profession is that it favours mm-hmm. people who have socioeconomic advantage and being able to not work. And that's bad. That is bad. It is bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. I agree. <laughs> um And I think that's really important as well because what we do by insisting that it is an unpaid placement is we do devalue the work that can be provided. Now, in a number of settings, um, provisional psychologists provide incredibly valuable work. In some settings, um, like very complex settings, I think there is less, less that they can provide. It is far more of a learning experience and you are really kind of tagging along and, and learning the ropes. There's a lot of coaching and teaching required. But that they are the they are more of the rare experiences. So I'm thinking like you know acute wards and um, you know tertiary settings. Most of the work in NGOs and you know private health could be very easily addressed by provisional psychologists under adequate supervision. It's really about how do we manage our resourcing and where do we get funding from. So if you have a Medicare system which largely governs the private sector that doesn't pay for these services, it's very hard to then provide a paid placement. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And I've heard that as well. So I've had some colleagues, um, for example, have a placement in a public hospital and because the public hospital system is so understaffed and under-resourced, they were like, great, free labor. And then the students were doing essentially what the qualified psychologists were doing. Um, And so it wasn't so much a learning experience. It was like free labor. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. 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 That does happen too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So what I'm hearing, and I just love the word consortium. Um, it just sounds like a little secret society. I just, I just really yes. like it. It's a great word. Um, so, a great word. Yeah. So there's consortiums happening and you're all coming together annually to be like, this sucks. Uh, let's do something about <laughs> what it. What do we do about it? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. It sounds like the, the initiative that New South Wales took and that you were involved with, with supporting the supervisors, was that something that arose from that? Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, key key um, universities came together and, and we represented, I guess, the whole of all the placements provided in New South Wales, which is a powerful force to then go to, you know, mental health directors, to operations managers, to HETI. And that's where the HETI project and collaboration came from was HETI identifying that they could provide and fund supervisors to be trained and supervisors from various um, universities volunteering their time to provide this supervision, uh, sorry, to provide this training to people who wanted to become supervisors. So that was one of the initiatives. And I'm no longer involved, so I can't tell you about more of the latest things that that may be happening, but that was one of the big projects. And another one of the big projects was talking about the workforce shortage and the bigger problems that, you know, we're already dealing with that large organisations, I don't think are totally across. Mm. So that's one initiative that it can really make a big impact. And do you think that was quite successful? Yes, absolutely. We had, we had, I think there were, there were massive numbers of people in the health sector that took up that training opportunity. And I myself ran a number of our supervisor trainings. You know, there were, you know, 15 to 20 people in each of those things that I ran and my colleagues were running them as well. So absolutely. It, it made a big difference with the number of supervisors that were, were available then. Okay. That's amazing. Thank mm. you for doing that. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what else can be done to support places in offering placements? Mm. Look, I think that the government has a big role in how they fund our training programs. We know that for the universities and um, providers of master's levels, master level programs, 
they run at a loss. They're very expensive programs to run. Anything that requires the level of training that we require take a lot of hours. We can't just put you all through a mass quiz with the option A, B or C that we assess you on. Like We are there face-to-face watching videos in with you in sessions. We're managing very high levels of skill. So I think if governments were able to pitch in, and we have had that in the in the the budget was announced more funding for places at universities. I think we need to provide we need to provide scholarships in far greater numbers than we currently have for our students, and that can be another way to address this issue around you know financially supporting ourselves. But ultimately, I think we need to have a restructure of the way that we understand our workforce and the training structures to replenish our workforce. My, uh, you know, alongside like the medical, the medical system where they actually do, it, the infrastructure is there to train the next generation of doctors and it is considered an integral part of the workforce. We don't view psychology in the same way. At the no, definitely not. So my understanding with the medical profession is like they have training hospitals, they have dedicated places where graduate um, medical students can go and learn how to become medical specialists, um, but we don't have anything of that sort for psychology. Well, it's, it's, it's a little bit different to that. It's probably even better for them, but worse for us. Okay. In that, um, it, all, like, all the public hospitals have a role called, like they have various roles that have different names. They might be a medical officer. They might be a registrar. And all of those dictate their level of training. So they're all still training. They have a certain um, job to do and certain qualifications, and they can do no more than what that dictates. They get paid, apart from when you're a medical student in your undergrad degree, those roles after that you apply for, you interview for, you then are a part of a team in that role until you are fully qualified. But most of the teams are consisted consist of people in the process of training. Hmm. Okay. So do we need to replicate that structure for psychology or are you thinking of something a little different? Well, look, I mean, I, I don't know what, what is possible here. I know that, um, you know, in the UK, there is, there is pay, like people in training in psychology are considered part of the workforce and that gives a very different training experience. It is one model that is worth looking at and it's already been done. It's already, it's already been happening for a long time in the medical profession. We just need a radical rethink of it because it's not sustainable and we're seeing that very clearly. We don't have enough psychologists in the profession. We have psychologists leaving the profession. Um, we don't have enough training positions. The training positions aren't sustainable because of placement. So there's a big systemic problem here with how we're approaching this. Yeah, it really just sounds like psychology is imploding because it's like I know there's, <laughs> yes. there's such a big push from the public and psychology students to have more master's place places available Mm -hmm. so that we can increase this workforce. But like you say, a limiting factor is like, well, we don't have enough placements for all of you and that's what you need. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And unfortunately, there's not like this big, you know, like uh, say before, if most of psychology was in the hospital sector, you had someone in charge of the hospital sector that you could go to. But now because we're spread across so many different kind of jurisdictions, it is more complex. We have to approach NGOs individually because there, there are many individuals that are prov- have provided, provided with the funding to run services and they're different from one district to the next district. We can't just go to a single person in leadership and say, here's a problem. We've got a really, really diverse um, mental health system. And then you've got the private sector, which is growing, and they're all different leaders in the private health sector. There's not one big governing director of private health. Mm. So it makes it complicated. And if people aren't familiar with psychology, like if those leaders aren't familiar, I assume there's an educational aspect to that as well, being like, okay, here's what our graduates can do. Um, here's the valuable skills they contribute. Yes, absolutely. And we're c- certainly seeing that um, lack of knowledge play out because, you know, psychology has not been able to produce sufficient numbers and there are issues in, you know, in conflict between endorsement areas in psychology. Mm. But the overarching message is psychologists, they could be psychologists, they could be an OT, they could be a physio, they could be allied health and you will perform the same role as a mental health worker. Yeah. And so there's been a diluting of, I guess, the value that psychologists add to the workforce, which is unique and different to other allied health professions. 
Wow, it just keeps on getting harder and harder, doesn't it? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Well, well, this sucks. Um, but, you know, I feel like I've got an answer to my question about why it's so hard to get placements. I feel like you've explained yes. this really well. Thanks, Avril. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. That's all right. Yes. I mean, I knew it wasn't going to be rainbows and butterflies this episode, so that's okay. Are there any other barriers that we haven't spoken about for places to deliver placements to students or any other solutions? I think there are some solutions. I think um, I think the solutions lie in people coming together and collectively um, using our power to negotiate and influence people in leadership. So much like the consortium, when you can say, you know, Avril is a placement coordinator at one university, I want a placement, that's very different from saying I represent all of the placements in New South Wales and this is what we're requesting and this is what we can negotiate with you on. So I think, you know, taking a bit more of a, um, I guess, the long view when you're in positions of power, needing to leverage leverage the discussions around things that matter to the people in leadership that you're talking to. So the director of operations in a, in a health service is going to want people to employ. They're going to notice that they can't employ psychologists or they're very hard to find. And so the argument then becomes, well, you need to be able to also provide training. How can we help you with that? How can you provide placements? How can we help you with that? And finding those collective solutions together, I think, is the way forward because people are not providing the placements because they don't want to. It's because there are pressures that work against providing that. So if we can all find the solutions to work together, then I think that is the way forward. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, is there an incentive for universities to solve this problem? Like, are they, is, is there a reason for them to do something or are we just going to be stuck in limbo forever? Yeah. Look, I think that there is an incentive for the providers of the programs. They are very, very invested in making sure that we have good quality training and that we can find placements. Whether or not universities themselves on a higher level have that level of concern, I, I don't think so. I think probably the a lot of the time um, universities provide these programs as a status. So it is provide status to say I have this clinical psychology training program, master's program. That's why students go there for undergrad. So you mm. get money through offering that, but you do, do not make money in the delivery of that program. Gotcha. So... It's a mixed answer if they have an incentive. They do, but they've kind of got their solution already. And I think the people within the program, the ones that are really, really struggling trying to find these placements, trying to do the best for their students. So it's whether or not we can, you know, take that conversation to to, to people that have real to power decision-making ability. I wonder then if the incentive is talking to workplaces and being like hamming up, I guess, the unique skills that psychologists provide and being like, look, you really do need mm. a psychologist on your team. Yeah, absolutely. And and us being more vocal about what we provide and the value add that we offer. We're not like many other people seeking placements where they're in an undergraduate degree and they're in their third year of training. You know, by and large, students are in master's programs. They have had five plus years of study behind them. Um, there are many people with long, like long histories of of being in the profession that have come back to do endorsements or you know an additional endorsement. So we're very, very skilled people, but that is not widely understood. So yes, I think there is an argument for that in speaking with people who do make decisions about the workforce. Avril, is there anything that we can say to listeners if they're one of these people who the university has been like, go forth and find your own placement, good luck. Um, is there anything oh, that yes. they can do to just help themselves get a placement, like any ins or viable pathways? Definitely, definitely. Look, when you're approaching people, I would very much encourage you to sell your skills to show what you are capable of and what you're able to do. Something that I would do a lot in private practice settings is I would say that this um, having a student could be a really great opportunity to provide a gap, the bridge between, you know, that session 10 plus when a, when a client maybe needs more mental health care sessions, they've run out of funding, they are in need of it, and it may help that stretch a little further. So you could say, okay, I'll see you for your first three sessions, then I can see there's some real, there's some real value in you doing some anxiety, psychoeducation and some practical behavioral, you know, behavioral changes. My student here would be great and they can offer this free of charge, right? So using the students and the provisional psychologists in very strategic ways can help you in your private practice. 
So you could then support a client across the whole year by spreading that out. That can be a good thing to suggest to placement, um, potential placements. The other thing which I think we undersell ourselves on is our research ability. Yeah, true. So whilst you're, yeah, whilst you're in placement, what a great opportunity to provide some research and analysis for whatever organization you're in. It might be, let's have a look at the number of clients coming in and what the proportion of presentations are. I can provide you, I can, I can support you in whatever it is that your organization would like data and feedback on. Or we're going to run this group. Um, I can look into researching that, creating a flyer, creating the support, creating the group, supporting running that group or be involved in that. Sometimes also running a group and being that second person is another really great way to help organizations and private practices be viable in delivering mental health services with a provisional psychologist. Yeah. So you could be delivering a group to 15 people with your supervisor and you're the second person there running the group. That's another way to offer your value add. Yeah, totally. Um, Mm. So there are creative solutions and where the student psychologist can add value. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. it's just knowing those ways and and finding what it is that that organisation does and where you could value add. Yeah. How can students approaching placements, like is it possible for them to leverage the relationship with their university Yes, unit coordinator and be like, I'm going to CC unit coordinator in, like, could that be a good? I mean, depending on what your university says is okay, it definitely can be. Yeah. Um, I know that a lot of universities, including my university, um, would offer uh, free supervisor training if you took on a supervisee. And that is another way to provide an incentive, but your organization, your, your university has to be able to provide that and set that up as an offer. Yeah. That was always a big incentive for people who did want to do it, but the barrier maybe were those few thousand dollars to become a supervisor through the training. So that could be something you could talk with your universities about. Is there a way to incentivize taking students? This is what's being done elsewhere. Mm. Another thing has been at, at um, my old university was also putting together research component of the program with the clinical placement. So it was embedded together that you needed to provide some research output for the organization that you're with. That's a good idea. And then that value yes. adds to the organization and you get to do the research component. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yes. So you're finding those unique skills that we have and speaking to the organization. So you do have to do your homework. You can't just be cold call, hey, can I can I take a placement? You have to look up that organization. You have to say, is there the possibility of me having a placement and what could these unique needs be of this organization? They're small. Maybe I could provide intake support. Maybe I could add on with with clients that need extra sessions. Maybe I could do the practical stuff like, I don't know, going outside and doing that exposure with them rather than saying that's your homework. Go yeah, away totally. And do that. Like, yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Mm. Thank you, Avril. I hope that helps. It's very <laughs> Good helpful. Luck. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think it was really helpful to point out that I guess there are groups of people who really do want to make this better for the students. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's not like everybody is like, well, I guess we'll just continue this. This sucks. Good luck. Um, yes. There yes. are groups who are really wanting to make it better. So it is hopeful. It is hopeful. I'd say by and large, all of the psychs I've talked to have wanted this. It's yeah. really been what has limited that limited them, which has stopped them from providing a placement. Mm. I hope mm. we can continue to see that systemic change then in the future. Yes. Let's hope for that. Yeah. Avril, if listeners want to find out more about you or learn about what you do, where can they find you? Yes, they can provide. Uh, they can find me at www.bodiandpsychology.com.au. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. You can find me and chat with me there. I'm also providing, um, I've just found out that I'm being able to provide a supervisor masterclass in diversity, which will be the first time that's uh, been offered. So, Look out for that if, if you're a supervisor and you want to do some do some extra training in that. Fantastic. I'll pop those links in the show notes where listeners can find it. Thanks so much, Avril, for coming on and explaining this really complex topic to us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Glad to be with you today. No worries. And listeners, thank you so much for listening. I hope this was helpful and not too depressing. Remember, there is hope <laughs> and you can do things. <laughs> things will get better. Okay. Take care, listeners. Catch you later. Bye.